All right, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, have to re-record this lecture. That's fine. Um, we had some technical issues happen. Uh, as you all know, the internet went out one day. Uh, I then re-recorded it. And how yesterday my microphone wasn't working happened again. So um, I'm now recording it again. So hopefully this all works and um, we can get through this class. I'm just going to go through it pretty quickly. I'll probably spend about an hour on it. Um, but this is really important stuff. This is the other uh, remaining promulgated forms of the other contracts. Um, I know in Chapter 7 we went over the agendas and everything else that's promulgated by Chris, but these are going to be the other five contracts besides for the one to four family. So we have the one to four family and then five other ones. There's six total. So learning objectives today, we're going to identify the ways in which the other five promulgated contracts differ from the one to four family. We're going to describe the proper use of the residential condominium contract, the proper use of the farm and ranch, uh, unapproved, the new home contracts, both the new home complete and the new home incomplete. And then we're also going to um, go through. So, okay, so here we go. So these are the six forms that are promulgated by TREC. So you have the, the one to four family contract, which is what we went through on Friday. We went through completely and filled out all the information about it and everything. You have the new home contract, so the incomplete construction for it, um, and the new home contract complete construction. So you're going to have both uh, if the house is incomplete or if the house is complete, but nobody's lived in it before. Uh, the farm and ranch contract, the residential condominium contract. If you all remember what I was saying about the one to four family, um, at the top I have to notice it says not for use for condominium transactions. That is because a condominium transaction would use this residential condominium contract. And then also the unimproved property contract. So what I'm going to do, so for example, this is, all the slides are going to look like this. It's just, is it different? And then the new home contract, wherever one we're going through, and then the paragraphs that are different. However, those are those have changed now because, again, the contracts have changed, um, which is why I wanted to get this video out as soon as possible, is because if you watch Justin's lecture, it might not be 100% accurate um, just because there have been changes to the contracts. So what I'm going to do is pull up both of them side by side, and I will go through, pull up both of them side by side, um, and I'll go through them uh, together. You can, okay, so on the left here we have the new home contract, and on the right here we have the one to four family. So. Again, none of these are going to be used for condominium transactions or closure units prior to completion of construction. Again, if you're using a condominium, you use that condominium transaction form. So, um, an incomplete construction would be used in the situation of one, if I contacted a builder, or if there was a builder who, let's say, built a shell of a house and then I wanted to purchase that shell and then kind of have a contractor come in and complete the interior of it. Um, you'll also see this in a lot of, there's a lot of kind of like prefab neighborhoods that are kind of pre-made. It's kind of like when you can get a car from a dealership and you can uh, customize the parts for it. So you get a, you know, you can go to the, let's say the Ford dealership and get a new Mustang that you can get with these type of seats and with this and you can kind of customize it for you. Um, now that will make it a little more expensive. And same with this, if you get a prefab house and you kind of customize it a little bit more expensive. But for example, my my sister-in-law and her husband actually just bought a um, a house in Hall where I grew up, and they got a incomplete construction home. What they did is there is a neighborhood they were building where basically they would give you kind of templates or layouts, and you can pick which layout you wanted, and they got to kind of customize what the exterior walls were made of, the color of the wood flooring, stuff like that. Um, no, they weren't exactly building their own house. Like again, they had templates they could pick out of, but um, basically one of the things they got to do was they had the option of a, um, I think it was a two bed, two bath, or a three bed, two bath, or they could do a four bed, two bath. But if they did the two bed, two bath, or sorry, the three bed, two bath, it would be three beds and an office. Like one of the bedrooms, they would turn into an office. Not saying, I mean, and by that, I mean like, it didn't have like one single door. It had like open double doors um, that were kind of glass and, you know, whatever. And it was more like office doors. Um, so that is a situation where they bought a incomplete construction and got to kind of customize 
the spe specifications of the house to their own liking. Um, so to start with the changes, if you look here in, in paragraph two, if you notice on the new home construction contract, um, there are there is no um, improvements or accessories. And the reason for that is there's nothing that has been improved or there's no accessories on the property. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to worry about things conveying or not conveying because everything that's at the house will convey because it's not even a complete house yet. Um, accessories are not in there because there's most likely not going to be curtains and rods, blinds, window shades, draperies, stuff like that um, because the house is not complete. So they probably haven't even put that stuff in yet by the time the contract is going through. So there is no reason to have um, improvements or accessories or even exclusions because again, it's not like the seller is going to want to take anything with them. That's what exclusions is for. It's for the seller to take stuff with them. They don't have to worry about that because there is no, um, there is nothing that is going to be staying behind. Um, or no, sorry, there's nothing that's going to be taken with the seller because the seller is a builder, not so much a person who has personal property. All right, there is also a change in paragraph four. So if you look here in paragraph four, there is no residential or fixture leases. It just goes straight to natural resource leases. Now, any property that deals with land, you will deal with natural resources. That is because um, you are still dealing with the, pro the, the land of the property. Um, and again, if you deal with the land, you're dealing with the, the stuff that goes down to the center of the earth and up to the sky, which is basically going to be any minerals, anything like that. So with this, it is a new home, so there is no fixtures prop. There is no fixture leases. You're not going to have a lease on a water softener system or uh, for paint tanks or solar panels because the house isn't even complete yet. You can get those leases once you decide to move into the house, or you can get those leases added to um, the construction of the house, but that's not going to be part of the contract because it is not something that has to transfer from the seller to the buyer. Another thing, residential leases. If, I, if you remember, this is where you would put in if you were doing a um, a seller's temporary lease or a buyer's temporary lease. The seller is no, they don't have the option to do a temporary lease because the seller, again, it's not just them building one house, it's probably a company that's building 50 houses in a neighborhood. The seller is not going to stay behind and live there after closing. And also, there's no buyer's temporary lease because you can't move in before closing because the house isn't complete. Um, by the time this contract finishes, there's usually a date of completion and then there's a date of like being able to. Of the, the date of the closing of the contract, sorry, and then a date of completion of the house. Um, those are usually two separate things. All right, another change is going to be here in paragraph six. There you go. Oh, sorry. So here in the survey, if you notice in, in paragraph C for the survey, so 6C always deals with the survey. Um, <clears throat> There is no, so right here, this box one on the one to four family. By the way, the one to four family is always going to be on the right side of the page just to make it easier. Um, it will stand up all the time and I'll go through the tabs of the other contracts individually. Basically, right here, this box is saying that within blank days, the effective date, seller shall furnish to buyer and title company existing survey. Well, the problem with that is that if the house is incomplete, there cannot be an existing survey. Um, so if you look over here on the, on the incomplete construction, they basically have seller at seller to spend shelf provide a survey or buyer at buyer's expense shelf provide a survey. They have boxes two and three as the only two over here because again, a survey would take part. They also they would do the meets and bounds or whatever of the actual um, property, but they also have to go around a uh, permanent structure. So if you have a pool, they have to survey the pool. They have to survey your house. They have to survey all that stuff. If it's an incomplete construction, they don't have all that stuff yet, so they can't get a survey yet. Um, so that is why a survey cannot have already been done for an incomplete construction, which makes this this paragraph over here slightly different because it does not have uh, like section one of it. All right, in seven, there's also a difference here because you look at the one to four family, you deal with the seller's disclosure and the seller's disclosure of blood based paint those do not have to be in, those are not going to be in the new home. 
we only have to have a seller's disclosure if somebody's lived in the property before. Um, so if the home is completed and somebody has lived there, you have to have a seller's disclosure. Now, because of that, like I said, <clears throat> sorry, new home incomplete would not have construction, or they would not have seller's disclosure. They will, however, have construction documents, which is basically going to, um, it, it's a promise that the construction company will work in a way that is diligent and according to the, um, the documents they provided. So you're not going to worry about, well, now that somebody's under contract, we can just kind of nap. Like instead of doing um, 16 on center for studs, we can do 24 on center because what? It doesn't matter, they're already under contract. Or they can kind of slack off in their, um, their, their work because you know, they don't have to worry about it anymore. We're already under contract of getting their money. This is basically a promise that they have to stick with what the construction documents say. They cannot vary and even just like, well, we put an office here instead of a bedroom because we thought it looked better. They have to go with what you have decided and what the construction documents say. If the construction documents say you need a stud every 16 on center, every 16 inches on the center of the stud, then they have to, they have to do that for the entire property. They can't just, uh, skip a room and you know do it a little bit wider because why not they have to stick with that there's also cost adjustments that is another paragraph that's going to be in here that's not in the other one now what this is for is if we decide let's say i decide to buy a house that is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars everything's going good and then all of a sudden the cost of lumber skyrockets well now that house is no longer worth 250 um, and in completing it, it's going to cost a lot more for them to complete the construction than they originally thought. Now, what this paragraph basically says is that they are allowed to extend or to, um, they're allowed to increase cost based on the price of the, the cost, increase the price of the house based on the cost that it, it takes to build the house. Sorry, um, saying it would cost a lot. So that is what C is for, it's cost adjustments. If it costs more to build it, it's going to cost more um, in the price of the property. If it costs less to build it, it will cost less for you to buy the property. And as you can see here too, there's also no seller's disclosure of lead-based paint. That is because, if you remember, lead-based paint only counts if it was built before 1978. There is no way this property can be built before 1978 if it's a new home that is being built right now. Um, so that is a situation. That's why that is no longer, that is not in there. Uh, here, this is a good point too, right here. So in E, we have the completion. So this is going to basically point out when the property is going to be completed and, and it's going to be done. Um, so if you have, now you can't always be 100% accurate. Um, Let's say they must convince 10 days after the effective date and it'll be completed no later than August 15th. Let's just throw out numbers. Um, that, that's a long time to build a house, but let's just say it'll take three months. Um, if you were to put this in here, um, while it might not be finished on August 15th, you can guess, um, you can get a good estimate of how long it's going to take. Um, if you put in August 15th, you know it's probably not going to take till October. Um, if you put in July, whatever, if you put in June, whatever, then you know that they, they're going to be working quick. Um, however, there is natural things that can cause that to be extended. You know, nobody expected this snowstorm and ice storm that we got where it was literally four degrees and it snowed for three days or whatever. It kind of shut down. We lost power. Everything shut down for like two weeks, basically. Um, you can't really expect that and so or count for that so in that situation if something was due you know the date like two days after the ice storm hit they probably had to push that out till after they could get back to work and finish up those last touches um so again this is in here to give you an idea but it, it it's not always going to be 100 percent accurate it can change all right and then Another thing about um, now that I'm thinking through this, another thing about uh, incomplete new homes is to keep in mind 
what's good for everybody, um, you will find out that you will you will get things that say, um, you know, for example, in my house, like I might want a room that's solely used for uh, ping pong and disc golf, and I put a bowling alley or something. And like that's something that's stuff I like to do. I can get a whole wing in my house to do that if I wanted to build it. However, if I put in there that instead of having four bedrooms, I want one bedroom of a ping pong room of this and of that, which are specifically made to those, and it would be kind of weird to change anything else. That might be awesome for me and my wife, but it's going to suck when we go to try to sell the property because other people might not be looking for that. Um, so that is something to keep in mind if you're doing, if people are doing incomplete constructions is to keep in mind kind of a general idea. Uh, if you're going to build a three bed, two bath house, cool. People are looking for that a lot. If you're going to build a four bed, three bath house, or four bed, two bath house, cool. A lot of people are looking for that. But if you want to go, well, let's only do one bedroom and then we have three offices that don't have closets and they have to put closets to be considered a bedroom. So one bedroom, three offices of this room and of that room and a, and a big like game room that takes up half the floor that just has a pool table and some really cool stuff in it or whatever. Um, while it might be cool for you, you're actually lowering the value of your house because when it comes to selling your house, you're not going to get people looking at it because people are going to go, well, I have a family. I needed these three bedrooms and you only have one. Um, so it is good to keep that in mind when you're building a house or if you have a client that's looking to do an incomplete construction, just try to keep, keep that in mind when you're talking to them. Um, make sure they don't, they don't go too crazy. Um, if you want a game room, cool, that's fine, but don't have four of them sort of thing. Um, all right, the other change here is going to be the prorations and rollback taxes. So if you look here on the new home, um, you have rollback taxes, which are going to be this paragraph B down here. And on the order for family, you don't have that. Now, basically rollback taxes, those can occur, um, they occur in new home construction. So both complete and incomplete and in farm and ranch and unimproved property. Those are the four places you're going to see them. Now, what rollback taxes are is basically if in August I bought a house that used to be an agricultural land, but they did a new home and now it is residential and not agricultural and it doesn't have, it doesn't have an ag exempt anymore. When I go to pay my taxes, when they went in last year, they filed for it as agricultural. When I went in to pay my taxes, they are going to learn that it's not agriculture and it's residential. So they will have taxes for me to pay from what they thought I would owe. Basically, when I go in and tell them, oh no, I bought it on it August 30th um, and it's now residential, not agricultural, that basically they can go back and then post ag taxes from August 30th to the end of the year and make you pay those taxes like it's residential, not like it's um, agricultural land or whatever. Uh, this happens a lot in zoning changes between commercial and residential. If, if a residential property changed to commercial, you go in at the end of the year to pay taxes for your commercial property. They can, when they learn that it's not residential anymore, they can in post add the taxes or take away the taxes um, that have been incurred since the, res, the zoning change, if that makes sense. I know that's kind of confusing to think about or wrap your head around. Um, but basically in post they can go when was it changed okay cool well starting at that point we're going to charge you this taxes so actually now instead of going this you owe this basically what they can do um and again you'll see pro, uh, rollback taxes on new home construction incomplete and complete and then also farm and ranch and uh unimproved property because those are the four situations that the zoning would have changed um you won't see this a lot in commercial properties and stuff like that And then also another change they have here is on this last page with the executed date next to the signatures, you also have this big notice here. And basically what this notice is, is according to chapter 27 of the Texas property code, the contractor has to be notified if there are any deficiencies so they can come out and fix it. Um, Basically, if requested by the contractor, you have to let them know if something happens. Well, again, when my uh, sister-in-law and her husband bought the house, they noticed one of the walls was kind of leaning a little bit. 
uh, not leaning, it was kind of bowing because the, the, the stud they put in it was kind of warped a little bit. So he called them out and they went in and fixed that stud and made it where it's all straight now. Now that's just a minor detail that he was just really picky on because they kind of had the opportunity to do that and be picky about stuff. But according to chapter 27 of the property code, the Texas property code, they can contact the contractor and he comes out and fixes it as opposed to them having to call any contractor or any repairman or whatever. They call their own contractor who will come out and fix it. All right, now we're gonna go through the second of the uh, new construction forms is going to be the completed construction. So that in this situation, there's a builder who would build an entire house, complete it and everything. And at that point, you would go in and purchase the property, but nobody has, still nobody has lived in it yet. It is a new home that is fully built, but nobody has lived in it yet. That would be a completed new home construction. So again, um, same as, sort of same as the incomplete, um, Paragraph two is not going to have the improvements or the accessories in it um, because that is going to be, there is no improvements on the property and you don't have to worry about stuff conveying or not conveying. Same, there is no exclusions as well. The seller is not going to take anything with them. It is a new home. They have built it. Everything that is there is going to convey. So there's no reason to actually have these because you don't have to worry about permanently installed and built-in items. Everything in the house is going to be permanently installed or built-in by that point it is a completed new home. Nobody has lived there yet. There's no personal property there to be taken with the seller at the time. Um, on paragraph four with the leases, this is actually, it's going to be back like the normal um, wonderful family contract. The full, you get the residential lease, the fixture leases, and the natural resource lease. As a completed construction, they might have put solar panels on the property in which case they might have a lease for solar panels or for propane tanks or something like that. So just because it's completed and nobody's lived in it does not mean that um, does not mean that there won't be fixture leases or anything like that on the property. Now, there are residential leases. And again, like I said, the seller is most likely not going to be living there because it's a builder who's basically selling it and moving. Again, new home means nobody's lived there before. So it's not like he's currently living there when he sells the property. Um, but what this comes down to is that since the property is built and completed, there is chance for a buyer's temporary lease to move in earlier than closing at that point. So you are allowed to do that and move in earlier than closing, um, which is why this residential leases section is here in paragraph four. All right, back to the survey. The survey is actually going to be just like um, the one to four family contract. That is also back to back to normal, if you want to say it that way. Um, the reason for that is if you remember the incomplete construction, there is no chance that the survey will have been completed because the house has not been built yet. Um, here, the house is fully built. So there is a chance that when they built the property and completed everything, they got a survey ahead of time, in which case you can select box one and put in your five days or whatever there for the survey. Uh, for seven, for the seller's disclosure, Again, there is no need for a seller's disclosure because nobody has lived in a house yet. Now, this is weird because it comes to a point where if I were to build a house, had it on the market for five or six years, but never lived in it, but it was on the market, I've been trying to sell it, but I've, I've put it as $4 million and nobody wants to pay that for my house. Um, it will sit on the market for five years. When I finally do go to sell it, even if it's been five or six years, I don't need to get a seller's disclosure, even though you would think that because stuff could have gone wrong in the property or anything like that, you don't need to get a seller's disclosure because there's no, I have not lived there, so I might not know the condition of the house, but also I have not had anything, I have not done anything to the property that could have gone wrong. Um, over five years, stuff can just wear down and whatever, but there's no, I have done nothing personally to um, kind of tarnish the house. Now, I always require, or I would always advise that um, my clients get an inspection every single time, no matter what it is, even if it's a brand new home. Um, let's say Stefan built a house uh, and the day after he finished it, he wants to put it on the market. I would still advise my clients to get an inspection because you don't know if you build too good. What if you don't build it? Then you got a house that's falling apart that you thought was going to be fine because it was just finished, even though 
person who built it wasn't being as strict on their documents as they should have been, and so they built it funny, and now the whole thing's falling over. So that is a situation. That's why you always go get a um, inspection, even if it's somebody who, um, let's say, why it has a uh, doctorate in construction sciences or something like that. He is, he's a, he's got his master's degree. He's got his doctorate in construction science or, or construction or whatever. If that's the case, and he owns this company and he's been in the business for 25 years, he's probably not the one actually hammering the nails into the house. So just because there's a name on it that's really uh, notable and could be incredible, that doesn't mean necessarily that the house is in perfect condition because they're probably not the ones that have built it. They're probably not the company of people who built it. And you don't know what those people are going to be like. And so even though they might have a really horrible name, I always just advise they get an inspection. They don't have to. You can't force them to do anything. If they don't want to get one, there is a, um, I believe it's called like a notice of inspection required form or something like that. Um, basically, you can have them sign it which basically is a form that will tell them, I advised you to get an inspection, you refused, that's okay. But now some, if you move into the house and it does fall apart, it doesn't come back on me, I did my job in advising you. So this covers you. Um, but again, you don't have to force the buyer to make any of those decisions. So yeah, so here for the, the seller's disclosure, there is no seller's disclosure. There is just acceptance of property condition as is means that um so it basically skips down to d there is no seller's disclosure there is no um lead base painted in them there is also no construction documents and there is no nothing like that because the house is already done so they don't have to build in accordance to the construction documents the house has been constructed already there's nothing else to do um another thing to remember is that there is sections for insulation this is on both new home constructions it's on the other one too i just skipped past it um but there is insulation. And so basically here you put in the exterior walls of improved living areas insulated with blank insulation to a thickness of blank, which inches, which yields an R value, which basically is a resistance value. So if it's hot outside, how much your house can resist the heat and stay cool inside and vice versa. If it's cold outside, how much your house can resist the cold and stay hot inside. Um, so if it, has, if it has R value, it deals with insulation. Um, just remember that, but uh, I know you'll see R values. I know Aiden was talking the other day about how he had a client that's just, he was all about R values. Every time they went to a house, he was like, oh, the R values of the windows and blah, 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 the insulation of the windows and whatever. Um, so just remember R values is insulation. And this is a paragraph that'll be on both um, new home constructions. All right, and then I believe there is, yeah. So here you have the rollback taxes as well, just like the previous one. So again, just because it's a newly completed home, if it was completed four days ago, you might still have rollback taxes as of four days ago to the next year. Um, so again, you'll see rollback taxes for new homes, farm or ranch and unapproved property. And then there's also, again, this notice down here at the bottom, same thing. If something goes wrong in the house, uh, according to Chapter 27 of the Texas Property Code, uh, you can contact the contractor, basically, uh, an opportunity to inspect and cure defects as provided by Section 27.004 of the Texas Property Code. So that is also there, just like the other new home. Those are the only two documents that this notice will be in there, but it's in both of those. All right, now we're going to move on to the farm and ranch. Now this is where it gets a little bit more confusing as far as like what to use when. Um, but if you look at the farm and ranch, it's going to have fairly similar um, as far as land. You see land improvements and accessories and exclusions. You also have crops in here. Um, so crops is another section that is going to be in this that is different than the local family. Also in improvements, you have farm and ranch improvements and you have farm ranch accessories. So again, this is going to deal with stuff. Um, it's going to deal with like equipment. Um, I said, oh, I say equipment, heavy equipment, uh, permanently installed fixtures such as barns, pens, fences, stuff like that. It's not going to deal with stuff like irrigation systems or anything like that. 
that is all going to be still personal property. If you have a sprinkler outside, that's personal property. If you have even the big wheeling irrigation systems you'll see in the big fields or anything like that, that is still personal property because it can be removed easily. You can just carry that away. Um, so stuff like irrigation systems won't really count, but stuff like barns, pens, fences, um, again, stuff like that, those will all count because those are permanently installed fixtures um, or improvements on the property. Yeah, gates, sheds, out outbuildings, and corrals, all that stuff is going to be permanently installed. However, you do have residential improvements, so you do have stuff like if it was just a, a normal house. Um, the reason I said this can get kind of confusing is because if you have a 25-acre tract of land with a house on it, it can kind of get to a point where, well, do I need a farm and ranch or do I need a residential? Because they might not be using it for agricultural purposes, but it's a 25 piece acre land that could be used for a farm eventually. So is it a farm and ranch or is this just still a one to four family residential property with just a lot of land? Um, it can get kind of confusing. The best practice is just to ask the lender, um, ask the buyer's lender. They will know what form is required for the transaction. So if you have a, um, you know, if I was working with Jake, let's say Jake, so lender we use a lot here, um, super nice guy. But if I, if I was using him, you know, I would, if my buyer was using him, I would just call him up and say, Hey, I was going to put a contract. Do you need a farm and ranch contract or do you need a one or four family contract for this property? And he can look up the property and then kind of decide what form he, he would need in order to receive a loan for that property. Um, now you might get some people, um, that will say, well, I don't know, that's your job. It's actually not. Um, you might get some lenders that go, I don't know. Why don't you figure that out? You're the, you're the agent. That's just them because they don't know what they're doing. That's just them pushing it back on you because they don't know what to use. Now, it might seem like you should know, but if you think about it, this is a decision that will affect the people the lenders get the money from. Um, so if it's a bank, a lender is getting their money from it's the bank's decision what they will accept that is the lender's job to find that out if they tell you that they don't know that's your job you should know what form to use i don't know who you're getting the money from so i don't know what form they would accept that's not a question for me that's a question for the lender um i know justin's told stories of like he was working with a lender and they said to use a farm and ranch contract they went through, um, they got like a 45 day closing. They got through 30 of the days. And then the, the guy went, oh, actually I need a one to four family. Well, now you have to basically sign a novation, which if you remember a novation is a, like basically a cancellation of one contract to replace it with another one. So they had to switch out the contracts. Well, then they have to go through the whole process of starting the loan over. So now it's gonna be another 45 days before they can close. So now it's been 70 days. And now the, um, the lenders getting, the lenders trying to do their job, the sellers getting upset because they want their money and now it's taking 70, it's taking two months to close as opposed to 30 days, stuff like that. So it can get confusing and it can get really annoying. Um, I've had people that, I've heard of stuff where you do, do something like that and then the seller just backs out because they just don't want the hassle. So they'll just leave. Next thing you know, the, the deal's fall, it fell through because the lender said the wrong form to you. Um, I know Justin's also told stories of there is a situation very similar to that where they went through most of the contract in the one four family. Then he said, well, actually, I need a farm and ranch. They got him a farm and ranch. Well, it turns out with the farm and ranch, they didn't qualify or they didn't get the loan or something like that. They weren't accepted for the loan. Well, then the lender just kind of MIA and pieced out and just disappeared on him. Um, that can happen. I know Justin likes to say, if you do not hug or slap your lender, He's too far away. Um, we work with a lot of people either in town or at least that we know personally that um, we like to use. But if you use somebody like Rocket Mortgage or Quicken Loans, you never know where they're physically located in. So you might be talking to somebody in Michigan who's trying to get you a loan. Well, if they don't, if something goes wrong on their end, they can just kind of stop answering your phone calls and then suddenly they're disappeared. You don't even know how to contact them or get a hold of them. You can't drive over to their house because you don't know where they live so, or you don't know even what state they're in. So it can get kind of confusing that way. Uh, we like to use people either we know or if my buyer knows somebody personally, I'll give them a call and we'll talk and then go through it that way. That's fine too. Um, 
but I tend to try to tell people to not use stuff like Quicken Loans or Rocket Mortgage just because uh, it's almost too anonymous in that way. All right, so going through here, yeah. So the difference is going to be the farm and ranch stuff here. Um, if you see here too, and D, this is another change that's different from the one to four family, is that you will have that the sales price will or will not be adjusted based on the survey required in paragraph 6C. If the sales price is adjusted, sale price will be calculated based on the basis of blank per acre. I have had this in a contract before. Um, I actually just did one fairly, fairly recently where we were told it was 20 acres. But basically what they said is that if the survey comes back and says it's 22 acres, we owe another, let's say 5,000 an acre. Um, usually it's more than that, but let's just say 5,000 an acre. I need you sitting at the front because Linda's leaving to go take care of Okay, sorry about that kind of adjustment came in kind of talks. Um, so yeah, so I just did a contract um, fairly recently. Where I think it was it was more like um, maybe this. I think it was, 12, it was around twelve thousand an acre. I think is what it was. Basically, we thought it was twenty acres. We paid a certain amount for it, but this says that if the, if the survey comes back and proves that it's actually twenty two acres, then we actually owe twenty four thousand dollars more than what we thought we were going to owe. The purchase price has been increased by twenty-four thousand. If it comes back and says that it's twenty point five acres, we owe six thousand more than we thought we were going to owe. So that is just—you'll see that sometimes these bigger, like especially on larger pieces of land, because they might think it's one hundred and eighty acres, and then they go out and do a survey and realize it's one eighty-five. Now it might not seem like a lot, but when you're charging twelve thousand an acre, that's quite a bit of money you're missing out on if you don't have that stuff in. This also goes the other way too. So. If um, if the 20 acres we went and looked at turned out to be 19, it actually be 12,000 less than whatever the sale price is. If this was, let's say, 300,000 here, if this was 300,000, it turns out to be 21 acres, we now owe 312,000. If this is 300,000, it turns out to be 19 acres, we suddenly owe 288. Um, so that is why that changes like that. That is something that, yeah, that is something you have to um, keep in mind when you're looking at a contract. See if this is there or not. Sometimes, and and see what the number is too. I know I've seen stuff where like if they actually charge twelve an acre for the price, they might put six an acre here. I'm just saying that even if it's different, it might not be. They're not going to charge you as as much or as little or or give you as much of a refund, whatever. That's mostly that's usually common. Um, if you're paying like ten thousand an acre for the actual price of the land. You'll probably see 5,000 or so in that box just to make where the swing isn't as big. Um, however, it does say here that if the price is adjusted by more than 10%, either party may terminate this contract from writing a written notice to the other party, let's say within five days. Um, actually, let's say within three days. But so basically, if, if we had $300,000 as the sale price of the house for 20 acres, we put in here 12,000 an acre. It turns out it's actually 24 acres, and now we're paying 348 um, as opposed to 300. That's a big difference. Uh, we might not qualify for the loan, stuff like that. So that's a that's a much larger difference than now it's, oh, well now it's suddenly 306 instead of 300. That's different. But having it suddenly be 10% more or less, that's a big change. That This gives you an out where if it's too much more than, if it's too much money than you're willing to part with for this property, you can back out of the contract. And for the other side, if the seller has $300,000, it turns out to be 16 acres or something like that, and it turns out to be 240 or something as opposed to, um, or 260, as opposed to uh, 300, that's a big change too. They might want more money for that property. So they might go in and say, well, actually, it's six, you know, they might terminate this contract, put it back up on the market, as a smaller thing, a smaller track of land, but still have as much money or something like that. So that is what this kind of gives you all the, an option to back out of it. Um, all right, leases. So leases are going to be very similar to the Wonderful Family as well. You have residential fixture and natural resource leases. Again, anything involving land will have natural resource leases. And then, uh, let's see. And yeah, so in paragraph uh, six, where is it? Six A. 
if you notice here, there are nine total um, exceptions, and over here there's only seven. Um, basically, number one and number four are different. You don't really need to know any, but you don't really need to remember what those are, um, or even that this is different. Just remember that, like, paragraph 6A, there are differences between, um, and paragraph 6 for each contract. Um, and then also on C for the survey, if you notice there are three boxes here, there are four here, one of them just says no survey is required. Now that is a really interesting situation. I have never dealt with one that the survey is just not required. Um, but I have seen some sort of like tracts of land where they just don't, they simply just don't require it. The lender does not require it. Um, if it's a big enough property, something like that, they'll just accept how much they're giving you. I have not had anything like this because usually they're a little more strict than that and they want they want that survey. Um, but that is an option that could be selected here. All right, and then also before all the notices here that you get in E here, you have E and F, which are surface leases. And E is going to be the exception document. Now, these are um, the seller provided buyer with copies of the exception documents listed below or in the attached exhibit. Matters reflected in the exception documents listed below or on the attached exhibit will be permanent, permitted exceptions in the title policy and will not be the basis for objection to title. Now, what I, again, I've done with these contracts before, and what I've seen here a lot is there was a property that we were purchasing that had a natural gas pipeline under the property. And so basically once every three months, the company would bring a truck out to come inspect the pipeline, check on everything, maybe uh, draw some gas out of it, um, stuff like that. And so they had an easement here, um, an easement for the company to come check on the pipeline. Now what this is saying is that even though you're getting, you're purchasing a property, you're getting the house and everything, you cannot take this away. This is something that the company has required and they've signed like either a deal with or whatever, or they have to have access to the property and come up here and do this. You can't just suddenly tell them no and change the, like, you know, put a bunch of stuff up and block them from getting into the property. Um, you can have a gate, you just have to let them in, or you can change the locks as long as you give them the code, whatever. Um, but you cannot just simply look at these documents and go, yeah, I'm not going to use any of that stuff. If there's a natural gas pipeline that needs to be checked by law, you have to allow them onto the property to check that. Um, so that is what's, that's the type of stuff you'll see in these exception, exception documents. I haven't used these a whole lot. Um, again, I've done one transaction where there was a couple stuff in here, but they were all fairly easy. And it was, you know, they were worried that, they basically saw this and were worried that, well, does that mean that company's gonna be coming out once every other week and be bothering us and having us do this and that? And the guy was like, I've lived here for seven years and I think they've come out four times. Um, or three times in those seven years to check the pipeline. So like they do have an easement onto the property, but it, you'll see them once every other year to come out and check something. You're not gonna see them every day. Um, so that is what these documents are for. And then again, surface leases, um, basically follow the leases will be permitted exceptions in the title policy, same as these exceptions up here. Um, so if you have any surface leases, such as, again, if you have a drilling company that has um, a drill on the property, they have a lease to come out and use that drill that's on the surface. So you can't, basically saying in this, same thing as the exception documents, you can't refuse them that right if there's a lease on the property for them. All right, and then also a change here in 7A, these access and inspection utilities. There is a notice here that the buyer should determine the availability of utilities to the property suitable to satisfy buyer's needs. What that is basically saying is that if you buy a property out in the middle of, um, let's say outside of Caldwell, um, like halfway between there and Austin or something like that, you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's up to the buyer to determine what utilities are available in the area and how much it would cost to run those through the property. Um, it's not up to you as the agent, it's up to the buyer themselves to figure out that, well, I really like this piece of land, 
but there's no natural gas pipelines for within 10 miles or five miles. So if I want natural gas on my property, I have to run a five mile pipe to my property. Or um, cool, there's electricity here, but it's 200 yards away. I'm gonna have to pay to have that move 200 yards towards my property so I can get it on my house or whatever. Um, that is up to the buyer. It is not the buyer's agent. I know Justin has said he's dealt with people who will come by. Um, somebody tried to come after him because uh, they did not realize that they couldn't get natural gas to their house because it was like a mile away or whatever, like the nearest natural gas line or whatever, because they were out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and Justin basically said, that's not my job. That's your job. It says so in the contract. And he tried to help them. But then when they came back and were like, you didn't do your job. He was like, no, I did. And the lawyers are basically like, good luck trying to sue him because he did everything he's supposed to do correctly. Um, so again, this is something that is on the buyer to determine, but basically it's just, it's just a notice saying that they have to determine the availability of these utilities. All right, and don't let this confuse you. Um, so an E, you have completion of repairs unless otherwise agreed in writing, so it shall complete all of your repairs and treatments. And over here, an E, unless otherwise agreed in writing, neither party is obligated to pay for lender required repairs. So it's saying that neither party is required to pay for lender required repairs. And over here, it's a seller is required to pay. Don't get this confused. These paragraphs are just switched E and F and E and F. So if you look here, this is lender required repairs and treatments in F. This is lender required repairs and treatments in E. They are the exact same paragraph. E over here, completion repairs, and F over here, completion repairs and treatments. They're the same pair, they're the same thing. So don't get this too confused. Um, but just remember that, like, for example, lender required repairs, neither party is obligated to pay for lender required repairs. Usually that falls back, sometimes it falls back to the buyer because it's their lender who's requiring the repairs in order for the lender to accept the loan. But it's not necessary, the buyer does not have to do it. The seller does also not have to do it. So this is just neither party, they have to just agree to. to to who's going to be fixing those or who's going to pay for the fixing of those. All right. And then also 13, again, like I said, if it deals with possible change in zoning, so the farm and ranch unapproved property and the new home construction, you will deal with this rollback taxes here. So again, that is also another change in the farm and ranch is that there is rollback taxes as well. All right. Now we're going to move on to finally the condominium contract. So do you remember up here, not for use for condominium transactions. You cannot use anything for condominium transactions except for a condominium contract. So, um, and if you notice here too, not for use for seller owns fee simple title to land beneath unit. Now, if y'all remember fee simple title means you own, you fully own um, the land beneath your unit. So if you own, a condo with the land under it, you don't technically own a condo, you own a townhome, um, which would be a one to four family residential contract because you own the land. Um, condos specifically are properties where you don't own the land. Now, um, so there is this notice at the top. If you look here at two, the property and condominium documents, that is different than property. There is no land section. There is improvements, accessories, and exclusions there is no land section because again, you don't own the land. So instead you deal with the condominium unit, the building um, and the, the address the same, but you have to deal with the condominium project. So the condominium um, complex, you have to, that's what you put in there. Not so much uh, the lot and block and everything because you don't own the lot and block of that property. Now it is, a, it is another key thing that if, um, you own a condo what you technically own is the airspace between the walls i think i remember that on my real estate exam they asked a question about uh if you are if you own a condo and like what you technically own and one of them was the land one of them was the, the like the common areas you do not own the common areas the common areas such as like a lobby or if you had a pool or something like that uh, like a like a, uh, a like a pool for the complex or whatever you don't own any of that stuff. That is stuff that is commonly owned by all the people in the in the complex. Um, and you definitely don't own the land. Again, that's not what a condo is. So if you own a condo, 
if this room was my condo unit, I don't even technically own the walls themselves. I own the airspace between that wall and this wall, that wall and this wall. That is the stuff I own. So um, a lot of times they'll say too, like you might own the paint on the walls and that's it. You don't own the walls, but you can hang stuff. So like how this picture is hanging on the wall over here, you can own the picture, but you don't necessarily own the actual wall itself. So that is a, a thing term with condos is that you own the unit and you own the airspace between the unit. You have the airspace from the floor and the ceiling and the wall to the wall, but you don't actually necessarily own, you don't own the building. Uh, all the stuff on the exterior, so for this building, the exterior walls, the, if there are lights on the exterior of the property and stuff like that, that is not owned by me. That is commonly owned public area that is owned by everybody basically. Um, or by the, or the unit, for example, would be owned by, or the building, sorry, not the unit, the building would be owned by the complex, um, or whoever owns the whole complex, not so much you as a, as a tenant at the, or, sorry, not as a tenant, as an owner of the condo. So here you're going to have, yeah, so like I said, in here too, you have the unit instead of land. That is paragraph two in leases. You are not going to have, you notice there's residential and fixture, but like I said, there's no, um, natural resource lease because you don't own any natural resources because you don't own the land. Um, so, and if you remember natural, uh, yeah, so you, there, there would be no natural resources. You don't own any land. So there's no leases on, you don't own anything natural. It's kind of just another way to put it. You don't own anything natural. So you can't have a lease on minerals because you don't own the minerals from the property. You don't own the water. You don't own anything like that. All right. In 6C, um, if you notice here, it goes title policy, commitment, and objections. If you look over here, title policy, commitment, and like I said, 6C is always a survey. I kind of spoke, it's not the survey when it comes to um, condominiums because since you don't own the land, there is no survey to be done. You cannot have a survey for a condo because again, if this is my unit, I own this room. I do not own the land around it. So there's no survey that can be done on the land. Um, there's no meets and bounds or anything like that that you can do to get the survey for the property. Oh, right. There's another change, I believe. Yeah, if you notice in seven, um, just want to start quick. You will have a seller's disclosure because again, somebody has lived in the property, so there will be a seller's disclosure. Um, and then you have the acceptance of property and stuff like that. And then I believe. Yeah, and 12, if you notice it's 12A, 1, 2, and then B. Here we have 12A, 1, um, A and B still, 2, and then 3, which 3 is basically stating that in paragraph 12 that all, that the buyer still own or owes uh, the fees and stuff that the complex requires. So how we talked about in chapter seven, I know this is kind of, this was before it, but technically it's after it. In chapter seven, we talked about um, HOE fees and stuff like that. How I said that's not for condos. That is because of a condominium, you don't have an HOA, but you might have fees and deposits and stuff that are owned, that are owed to the complex or to the condo, um, whatever system, like the, the complex, wherever you, you live in. Um, you might have association fees, you might have dues, you might have reserves for stuff. Um, some people do like security deposits, like you would for a rental property. I've seen that before where you, you, uh, you know, you pay them $2,000 when you move in and when you move out, you'll get it. If, you know, if everything's up to, everything's still good. Um, but you might also have fees to use the amenities like the pool and the, if you have like a basketball court or something like that. Um, you might have to pay for, for access to those things. So that's what paragraph three is about. Um, let's see. If you notice 13, back to prorations, you don't have to worry about the zoning being changed because it is just, um, there are no rollback taxes because the zoning would not have, there's no land that could now become residential. It's just a condominium. Um, now I will say, I think there's a difference here yeah, so cash reserves from regular condominium assets or deferred maintenance of capital investments established 
by the association will not be credited to the seller. Any special condominium assessment due to unpaid, due and unpaid at closing will be obligation of seller. Now, what this is saying is how we talked about with HOAs in chapter seven. If the seller has not paid their dues to the association, to the complex or to the condo association, those will be owed at the time of closing. Um, they cannot simply step away from it. Uh, if they're unpaid at closing, the title company will make them pay that before they give them their funds from the sell of the property um, or for the sell of the condo. So that is the difference in 13. Uh, in 14, if you notice casualty loss is a little bit bigger of a paragraph. Now, the reason for that is a lot of it's the same. If you remember from uh, Friday when I went through the whole, the whole contract, casualty loss is the paragraph that will deal with if you were under contract for a one to four family house and uh, the water heater bursts up in the attic and kind of floods into one of the rooms, the seller is required to fix that back to its previous condition by closing. Um, so that is what casual loss basically protects the buyer from is that if something happens to the property, it's the seller's duty to fix it back to how it was before closing date. Now with this, the addition in the um, condominium version is that kind of the second half of this has to do with um, if any part of the common elements or one in common elements uh, is damaged or destroyed, that is not necessarily the duty of the seller to fix. If, for example, you live in a condo and the lobby burns down or something happens in the, the laundry room kind of wash area, area, that's not on the seller's, that's not the seller's job to fix that. Um, but basically what it is, is if, if something was to happen, let's say the lobby burns down, the seller notifies the buyer about like, hey, by the way, lobby burned down. The buyer has seven days from receipt of notice of such casualty loss within which to notify the seller in writing that the contract will be terminated. So if I am purchasing a property from Shelton, she lives in a condo, the property burns, or not the property itself, but the uh, lobby or the wash material, let's say the, the laundry room catches on, it floods and all the machines are broken or whatever, and she notifies me of that. I then have seven days from receiving that notice to tell her that I want to back out of the contract because of that. If I do not give her that notice within seven days that I'd like to back out, then I'm locked in the contract still and we move forward like nothing has happened. Um, but so that's basically what the rest of this is, is that um, if something happens in a common area, you have seven days as a buyer from receiving a notice of something happening to back out of the contract. All right. Now we're going to the very last one, which is the unapproved property contract. So um, this will be very similar to a farm and ranch, only this is when there's absolutely nothing on it. So again, how I was saying it can get kind of confusing. A farm and ranch had residential accessories. That does not necessarily mean there has to be residential stuff on the property for it to be a farm and ranch. Um, you could have 40 acres that are used for agricultural purposes that just has a barn and some pig pens or something like that, that will, that can still be considered farm and ranch and not unimproved. Um, unimproved just means there are no, um, there are no full structures on the property like a house, like a residence. There's no residential houses or anything like that or commercial buildings on the property. That is unimproved. So uh, if you notice in paragraph two, Again, you're not going to have the improvements, accessories, and inclusions. Because again, like the incomplete construction, there is no permanent house to have any of this stuff for. There's no permanent property. Uh, there's no re uh, residential house to have exclusions and stuff for. There's no structure on the property. It's just vacant land. All right, leases. Again, you'll have the natural resource lease. Like I said, anytime there's land, you'll deal with natural resource leases. However, there will not be the um, residential leases and the fixture leases because there is no, again, there's no residence on the property and because there's no residence, there's no fixtures. There's not gonna be a propane tank. There's not gonna be a water softener or security system, anything like that you might have a fixture lease for. So that's why it is just natural resource leases again. Um, there is a difference here. 
So you will start getting a survey. Like I said, if it deals with land, you, you have the ability to get a survey done. Um, but there is a change right here, um, which basically, if you notice, that is not. Here you go. So it's just from 6A1 through 9, which is right here, um, 6A1 through 9, or which prohibit the following use of activity. This says any portion of property lying in a special flood hazard area zone B or A as shown on the current federal emergency management agency map or any exceptions which prohibit the following user activity. So what this is basically getting to um, is that if it is in a special flood hazard area, that has to also be disclosed and that can that can be considered an objection on the property um, for unimproved property. So that's kind of all that is saying. Let's see, in 7A, you have that notice again of you have to determine the availability of utilities. Again, if you are trying to um, have a piece of land that has, and you want to turn it into a house, you have to figure out where you're going to get the utilities from. Is there electrical running in the area? Is there sewage running in the area? Is there water running in the area? Stuff like that. So you can figure out how much it's going to cost to connect all that stuff up. And again, that is on the buyer, not on the buyer's agent, just like the farm and ranch stuff. This is not about the buyer's agent. This is about the buyer itself. Um, there is also the acceptance of property condition as is. There is no um, seller's disclosure because again, there is nothing to be disclosed. There is no structure on the property. So you're not going to have to worry about a seller's disclosure. You're not going to worry about lead-based paint. That's only if a house was built before 1978. There is no house. So it cannot have been built before 1978. It doesn't exist. So <laughs> that is why there is no seller's disclosure or uh, lead-based paint in here. Let's see. Um, I want to say there is also, yeah, there's also not going to be anything here. If you remember, Residential service contract basically means home warranty. It's not a work for home warranty. So um, there is no section H in paragraph seven because there is no home warranty that can be purchased for the property because there is no house to have a home warranty for. That seems easy enough. Um, however, I will say here there is a seller's disclosure in quotations um, for, par for section E which basically means that you don't have to do a seller's disclosure, but by unless you've disclosed in this contract, the seller has no knowledge of the following, and that is flooding on the property, which has had a material adverse effect on the use of the property, pending or threatening litigation, condemnation, or special assessment affecting the property, environmental hazards, um, dump site landfill underground tanks or containers now are previously located on the property. If it is a wetlands, if it is considered a wetlands, uh, is defined by federal or state law or regulation, or if any threatened or endangered species are on their hab or their habitat affecting the property. Now, this is required because while you will not have a seller's disclosure in the sense of how old is the roof, how old is the HVAC unit, how, you know, was there any flooding that, you know, oh yes, the water heater burst when you replaced it and it flooded this room, we fixed it, whatever. You will not have that because there's no property to have, or there's no, sorry, not no property, there's no house uh, a residential permanent structure to have that effect. However, you will have to disclose that there is, for example, any flooding on the property which has had a material adverse effect. If you are in a flood zone that is a 50 year flood zone, one in 50 years, it's completely flooded. You will have to disclose that. Um, if there is any threatened litigation, so if somebody is in the process of suing you for the property or anything like that, you have to disclose that. If there are a if there's a rare endangered species of lizard, on the property or something like that, that has to be disclosed because you cannot just move in and tear all the trees down and build up a house because you are technically in danger, you're, in da you're threatening endangered animals at that point. So um, you have to disclose if any of that stuff is in your knowledge. And then also again, 13 here, you're going to deal with rollback taxes. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna keep saying this because trust me, it'll come up. Uh, for anything that deals with zone, possible zoning changes. So for example, land, um, that'd be farm or ranch and the unimproved property and the new homes, 
uh, you will see rollback taxes because then it's always a chance that that has been a zoning change that is now affecting the property. And I believe that is the only difference. Yep. So we're back to normal all that stuff. So um, that is the rest of the contract. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. I know it's kind of weird doing this class like this where I'm sitting in the empty room talking to myself. Um, and I know there might be things I said that y'all have questions of. Uh, if y'all do have any questions, feel free to let me know. And I'll be more than happy to uh, answer those. Just send me a text or uh, send an email over. I'm more than happy to, to try to clear anything up. Uh, I'll try to go through this stuff a little bit more again on Friday during our study session, just because I know it's, again, a weird thing. It's not hard to pay attention to stuff like this. So I'll try to run through it one more time. Uh, besides that, y'all have a good one. And I will see you all, uh, to be fair, I'll see you all in about five hours when I start the, the next class. So I'll see you all tonight. <laughs>